This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,000 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Pi is a number that needs no introduction, but while we all know what it is, most of us cannot explain why it shows up in such unexpected ways beyond a typical circle problem. Like it probably wouldn't surprise anyone that it shows up in the equation for the period of an object in a circular orbit, since there's a physical circle in this system. But those who aren't at a certain level of math or physics might be surprised that the time it takes for a mass on a spring to complete one cycle is a multiple of pi. And I think we were all surprised when 3 blue 1 brown showed how the number of collisions that occur in a two block system comes out to the digits of pi, which blew my mind and motivated me to do the research for this video. But as he says, pi shows up in all these scenarios because there is in fact a circle somewhere within the problem. Sometimes it's obvious, other times you need to dig a little, and other times a lot. So for these examples, see if you can spot the circle. For most of them, I could not. But we're going to start off with one that I can explain, which is known as Buffon's Needle. Now I know this is a very famous example that many other YouTubers have done, so if you've seen it, go to this timestamp. For the rest of you, here's how it works. Let's say you have a bunch of needles, each of some length L. Then you draw parallel lines which are separated by a distance of 2L. If you drop a large number of those needles on the table, some will cross one of the lines and others won't. And with a little math, you can find that the total number of needles that you dropped divided by the total number that intersect one of the lines will be pi. Well, approximately. And the more that you drop, the closer to pi you'll get. So if you drop, let's say, 314 needles, then likely around 100 would cross one of the lines. The general reason pi shows up has to do with the fact that the needle has an equal probability of falling in any given spot, but also at any angle, and here lies the circle. Right now it isn't crossing the line, but for certain angles it will. If that vertical distance from the center, or half the length times sine theta, is greater than the distance from the center to the line, then you have a crossing. I'm not trying to go into depth for this video, but if you perform a double integral, pi will appear. I found an online simulation as well, and if we drop maybe 100 needles, the calculated ratio, which ideally would be pi, is actually a little under 3. But if we drop several more, it won't be perfect, but that ratio will get closer and closer to pi. Okay, now that we've seen that, let's go to the other side of the spectrum with an example where I couldn't find a reason intuitively why pi appears, but it does along with e. Now you can see it in the math, which I'll link below, but the geometric reasoning as to why it shows up must be something else. So this is Stirling's approximation, which states that any integer n factorial can be approximated with this formula. And as n approaches infinity, the ratio of n factorial over that approximation gets closer and closer to 1, aka a perfect approximation. In fact, when n is 10, the formula is already really accurate. This is 10 factorial, and when we plug 10 into Stirling's approximation, we get this. These two values are very close as the ratio of the two numbers is just over 1.008. 50 factorial is about 3.04 times 10 to the 64th, while the approximation yields 3.036 times 10 to the 64th. The ratio of these is just over 1.001. And when n is 100, the ratio is this. And actually while editing this, I found something else really weird regarding this part of Stirling's formula. The 2 pi n here under the square root can also just be written as 2 n pi, same thing. And if we just make a small modification of adding 1 third to 2 n, the formula becomes much more accurate. With Stirling's formula for n equals 10, that ratio we just saw was this. But with the modification, it's just over 1.00006. And for n equals 50, the ratio goes from this to this. I found that very strange, and I don't have time to cover the details, but again, I'll attach sources down below. Now moving on, kind of as its own category, there are a bunch of series and products out there where it doesn't seem like pi would appear, but it does. And this is also something that 3Blue1Brown has done a lot of videos on, and all of them are between 20 and 30 minutes. So even for the ones I can understand, there's no way I can get through it in this one video. Like explaining why this series equals pi squared over 6, or why this alternating sum of odd reciprocals equals pi over 4, or why something known as the Wallace product equals pi over 2. But here's a series where I could not find that much information on it. And because I'm feeling lazy in terms of editing, I'm going to write this one out. Now before we see this series, we need a little setup first. Now the first thing we're going to do is write out a bunch of integers. Then we're going to make each of these either positive or negative, and here's the rule for doing that. 1 and 2 are automatically positive. Then any primes of the form 4m minus 1, where m is just any integer, 
will be positive. So like if m is 1, then we get 3 for this. Therefore, 3 is positive. If we plug in 2 for m, we get 7, which is prime, so that's positive. If we plug in 3 for m, we get 11, which is positive. But if we plug in 4 for m, we get 15, which is not prime, so we leave that alone for now. Then any primes of the form 4m plus 1 will be negative. So if we plug in 1 for m, we get 5, which is negative. If we plug in 2 for m, we get 9, which is not prime, so we don't touch that. 3 for m, we get 13, which is negative. 17 will also be negative, and you just keep going. Then for the composite numbers, all we're going to do is multiply their prime factors together to see what their sign is. So like 4 is 2 times 2, which is positive times positive, so that's a positive. 6 is 3 times 2, which are both positive, so that's positive. 8 is 2 times 2 times 2, which is all positive. 9 is 3 times 3, which is positive. But 10 is 5 times 2, which is a negative times a positive. So that's a negative. And then we just keep going. Then for the series, we really just add the reciprocals of these values. So we do 1 over 1, which is positive, plus 1 over 2, because 2 is positive plus 1 over 3, because again 3 is positive, plus 1 over 4, then we do minus 1 over 5, because 5 was negative, and we just keep going. If we did this forever, this series would equal pi, which is very weird. But after seeing explanations for several other similar series that had all those integers on the denominator, it's not too surprising that something like this would end up equaling pi. However, it's series like these that take it to a whole new level. This is Ramanujan's formula for calculating pi, and although it looks crazy, it's extremely efficient. For comparison with this series, since it equals pi squared over 6, we can multiply both sides by 6 and then take the square root to get an approximate value for pi. The more terms you have in here, the closer to pi you'll get. It's not until about 600 terms that this even gives you three digits of precision. With Ramanujan's formula, once you're one term in, just plugging in k equals 0, you get 3.1415927 and so on. The three and the first six digits after the decimal are already correct. Once you add another term, the approximation gets the first 15 digits right. And every new term after adds about eight more decimal places of precision. And it's formulas like these that we can use to calculate pi to billions or even trillions of digits. In fact, very recently, a similar looking formula known as the Chevnovsky algorithm was used to determine over 30 trillion digits of pi. For this series, after just one term or plugging in k equals zero, you already have pi calculated to 14 digits of precision. Then there are plenty more complex looking series involving pi, and I totally could prove them geometrically, but unfortunately I just can't fit that into the margin of the screen, so I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. Then this next example I like because again, it involves pi and e, and this is the Gaussian integral, which says that the area under this curve here is the square root of pi. This definitely isn't obvious, and for all the calculus people out there, you cannot find this analytically with typical calculus 1 or 2 integration techniques. On a high level, the circles come in from the fact that you can turn this single integral into a double integral. And if we were to graph this three-dimensional curve, the cross sections are all circles, as you can see here. Again, not going to go into detail on the actual math, but hopefully you can kind of see where circles would come from and why pi would appear. Now for this next example, we're going to take a random walk. What that means is we will start at the origin of the number line and flip a coin. If it lands heads, we move to the right, and if it lands tails, we move to the left. And we do this over and over. Maybe we flip and get heads, which moves us to one. If we flip again and get heads, we go to two. Then a tails would move us back to one, and so on. Now after a certain amount of flips, whether it be 10, 50, 100, or whatever, where am I expected to be on average? The answer is pi. No, I'm just kidding. The answer is zero, which should be pretty obvious. Sometimes you'll end at position one, sometimes negative two, sometimes negative 15, depending on how many flips you do. When you average those numbers though, you should get around zero. But what if instead we look at how far you are from the origin on average, as in the absolute value of displacement, which is always positive. So whether you end at two or negative two, they both count as a distance of two away. With this, we expect to see a positive average since you wouldn't land at the origin every single time, of course. Well, as the number of coin flips becomes larger and larger, the distance you will be from the origin on average becomes the square root of the number of coin flips times two divided by pi. So if you took a random walk with 100 coin flips, the expected distance you'd be from the origin at the end is just about eight. 
If you did many of these 100 step walks, this would be an example of what the distribution might look like in terms of your final distance from the origin. For a random walk after one flip, you have a 50% chance of being at plus one and a 50% chance of being at minus one. After two flips, you have a 50% chance of being at the origin and a 25% chance of being at plus or minus two. And I'll do one more where after three flips, it's a 12.5% chance of landing at three or negative three and a 37.5% chance of plus or minus one. But after you take more and more steps, the distribution approaches a bell curve. We saw before how when this curve is not normalized, the area under it is the square root of pi. And as we just saw, that average distance equation also includes the square root of pi. And for those who are curious, random walks do have applications. Like in physics, they can simplify Brownian motion that results due to particle collisions. Or in financial economics, people have theorized that the stock market evolves according to a random walk. And there's plenty more since a lot of real world situations deal with randomness. Okay, now let's see one last example also dealing with probability. As you guys know, every number is either prime or made up of primes, aka composite. Like 31 is prime, and 60 is not because it's made up of these primes and no others. In fact, there's only one way to represent any number as a multiple of primes. If you have two numbers that don't share any prime divisors, then they're called co-prime. Like neither of these are prime, but they don't share any of the same divisors. Now, if you randomly pick any two numbers, the chance that they are co-prime is six over pi squared, or about 61%. And if you remember from before, this infinite sum equaled pi squared over six, or the inverse of this probability. These both relate to the Riemann zeta function and come up when you set s equal to two. In terms of the probability calculation, this is also one where it's not too tough to see why pi appears in the math, but a geometric interpretation is definitely much deeper within the problem. And although this is not a part of pure math, pi appears in physical constants like the magnetic permeability of free space, or it can even be found in the buckling equation, which represents the force that an ideal column can support before reaching an unstable state. If you've ever stood on an empty can and applied a brief sideways force, causing it to become crushed immediately, this is kind of the math behind that. It's true that this infinite decimal simply comes from a ratio of lengths regarding a circle, but it's crazy to see just how often circles sneak their way into mathematics. And even though pi gets a lot of attention, just like with this video, I personally think E is even weirder due to how often that shows up, and maybe I'll do a video on that later. But for anyone who enjoys learning about these mysteries and puzzles of mathematics, physics, and more, you can continue to do so at CuriosityStream, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. CuriosityStream is a streaming service that hosts thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles from subjects such as physics in the universe, to technology and engineering, to crime and murder mysteries. To get started for this audience, you guys will very likely enjoy Genius, which was put on by Stephen Hawking. In this series, you explore questions like, can we time travel, where did the universe come from, and are we alone? I'm personally a huge fan of these documentaries that explore some of the biggest questions you can possibly imagine in ways that anyone can understand, and this is just one of many. Founded by John Hendricks, aka the founder of the Discovery Channel, CuriosityStream is an extremely affordable streaming service and only $2.99 a month that will satisfy anyone with a strong desire to learn, explore, and understand the world around us. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide including Android, Roku, Xbox One, Apple TV, and more. Plus, if you go to curiositystream.com slash majorprep or click the link below and use the promo code majorprep, you'll get your first month's membership completely free. This gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series that I know many of you will find very interesting. Again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything, and I'll see you all in the next video.